going to open up out of 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 19 through 21. And this is where we're going to find our topic of discussion. Again, 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 19 through 21. And I want to provide some context in this passage of Scripture. Elijah, J-A-H, has just experienced a profound encounter with God on Mount Horeb. And God commands Elijah to appoint a successor, Elisha. So you hear the name Elijah, that's J-A-H, and Elisha, that's S-H-A. So Elijah is commanded by God to appoint a successor. So this is where we're at in the passage of Scripture. So verse 19 says, So he departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him. And he was with the twelfth. Then Elijah passed by him and threw his mantle on him. Somebody say, I want the mantle. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, please, let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. And he said to him, go back again, for what have I done to you? In other words, this is between you and God. Go ahead and kiss your mother and father, but I, I dropped an opportunity on you. It's between you and the Lord. So Elisha turned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slaughtered them and boiled their flesh using the oxen's equipment and gave it to the people and they ate. Then he arose and followed Elijah and became his servant. Our topic of discussion for today is I'm all in. Tell your neighbor, say I'm all in. in. Spirit of the living God, have your way in this place. We acknowledge your presence in here. I ask that your Holy Spirit uh, would increase in and through me. We lay hold to revelation, to wisdom, to application, and most importantly, transformation. Father, I thank you that you will have your way in this place. We rebuke and come against every satanic plan and diabolical assignment of the enemy that will try to stop the word from going forth. In Jesus' name, and we all say amen. 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 Well, I'm talking to us today about I'm all in. And before I kind of unpack that, I want to go back to verse 19 and talk about the significance of what happened there. And the significance of 12 pairs of oxen was highlighted in Elisha's life. And this represents that Elisha was very prosperous, that he most likely was a part of a well-established farming operation, suggesting that he is coming from a place of stability and affluence. So the brother had it together. He had some resources. Verse 20, Elijah approaches Elisha and throws his mantle. It's a a cloak. He throws it over him, symbolizing a prophetic transfer, a prophetic authority that is being released. Now, Elisha understands that this, as a divine call, is a sign of being chosen as Elijah's successor. Some can say it was a prophetic transfer. For the context of our conversation, I'm going to call it, it was a new season. Somebody say new season. New season. Now, Elijah immediately responds by asking for permission to say farewell to his family. This indicates his willingness to follow Elijah, but also his respect for his family and traditions. Um, Verse 21 then talks about how Elijah then goes back, kills the oxen, uses the equipment to prepare a meal for the people. Then he follows Elijah. So Elisha does this, then he follows Elijah. Now, this is important. I want you to lean in on this. This act symbolizes his total commitment. Somebody say, I'm committed. Not only does it show his total commitment, it also shows the ultimate sacrifice. His former means of livelihood and his former life was now sacrificed so that he can step into the new life and the new season that was ahead of him. So uh, I want to propose to us today that the plans, the purpose, the destiny of God that is on our life has a key ingredient that none of us can avoid, and that ingredient for us to access God's plan, his prophetic power, and the new season is the ingredient of commitment. Somebody say, are you committed? And it requires sacrifice. Now, in summary, these verses illustrates, as I mentioned, the transfer 
are the transition of prophetic le leadership from Elijah to Elisha, emphasizing Elisha's immediate wholehearted response to God's call. The act of burning his plowing equipment shows that he has a depth of commitment to go after God. I wonder, are we demanding from life more than we're willing to give back to life? I wonder if we're asking for a fruitful season without first planting a sacrificial season. And it is very delusional to expect something from 2024 or to expect something out of life that you're not willing to give towards it, sow it as a seed. In fact, it's delusional to expect more people to pour into you than you're willing to pour into yourself. And what we're seeing right now is that Elisha is making the ultimate commitment and sacrificing. I mean, the brother had 12 yokes of oxen. That means he had 12 teams of, of, of oxen to plow. He was very successful, but he was willing to lose his current life so he can step into the life that God called him to have. And if we're going to step into the 2024 if we're going to step into the life that God has for us, there's some oxen that we're going to have to sacrifice. There's some things in our life that we're going to have to sacrifice. I wonder what we would be if we were really, really committed to the things of God. I wonder what our marriage would be like if we were really committed to our marriage. I wonder what our business would be like if we were really committed to our business. I wonder if we have the commitment that it requires for us to step into the plans of God. I believe that if we have that, the Bible says that in the, in the presence of God is the fullness of joy and pleasures evermore. We know about the joy, but we never step into the pleasures evermore because we have not been committed long enough to experience the pleasures evermore. So if we don't have the ingredient of commitment, we'll be forever wanting but never having. And the Bible says hope deferred makes the heart sick. And I know... Uh, like myself and many of you guys in here, we've all had something we prayed and asked God for. But when we look at it, did we really have the commitment or were we willing to sow the seeds to step into what God has for us? Now, this is interesting because Elisha shows the ultimate commitment because he actually was left by his mentor on two occasions. On two occasions... God had told Elisha to do something and told Elisha to stay here. And people came towards Elisha and was like, man, are you going to stay here? They were basically trying to talk him out of his commitment. You know how it is when people say, do it really take all that to, to serve God? Do you got to go to church on Sunday? Do, do, do you really got to do this and do that? Uh, you know, I tell, let me say this. Let me say it better this way. When, when, when I was in the world, I was a very extreme person and I was committed to sin. So, so now that I'm in Christ, I need to be extreme for the Lord and be committed to righteousness. And I got family in here. They'll tell you, uh, you know, Dane always went above and beyond to do what he was committed to, even if it was wrong. And when you, when you give your heart to the Lord, he doesn't want you to change that part of you. He just wants to change how you use it. Instead of using it for your flesh, instead of using it for sin, instead of you using it for your kingdom, your empire, he's saying, bring it under my jurisdiction and now use those ways that I gave you to now serve me with it. So... um. There are certain giants that I realize that in my life, they didn't fall until I was committed to God. There are certain giants in your life that will not fall until you find yourself committed wholeheartedly to the plan of God. You might have a giant of divorce in your generation, in your lineage. You may have a giant of addiction in front of you. You may have a giant of poverty mindset, but until you find yourself committed to the things of God, not picking, choosing which part of the word you want to use, but still praying for breakthrough. If you want breakthrough, you have to consistently abide yourself in the truth of God's word. As I mentioned earlier, it is very delusional to expect breakthrough, but pick and choose when you want to apply the word. If we're going to step into the fullness of God, it's going to take the fullness of us. 
that we have to be committed to God like we've never been committed before. Many people want the glory of God, but they don't want the suffering of God. And I've learned that if I'm going to step into God's glory, I also have to step in, embrace seasons of suffering. But seasons of suffering is not about dying, but more physically, it's more about dying to yourself. You know what it means to suffer? It means to resist your flesh. Just think about it when your flesh wants something and you resist it. You feel like you're suffering. I'm going to die if I can't have some caffeine today. In fact, on my way over here, I was like, man, I need some caffeine. Because you might have heard me say this before, when the anointing doesn't kick in, I at least need the caffeine to kick in. <laughs> That's a good word for somebody. <laughs> so, so we need the ingredient of commitment or some giants won't fall down in your life. There are some things that can be defeated from talent. There are some things that can be defeated from giftedness. There's some things that can be defeated from charm or beauty, but you cannot step into purpose and destiny with just talent alone, with just charm alone, with beauty alone, with, uh, with, with, with just giftedness alone. You're going to need those things. God gave you that. But to step into the purpose and destiny that Jesus Christ died for you to have, it's going to require commitment. Commitment. And commitment requires sacrifice. Commitment means that you're going to have to give up your way of how, to, how you want to do things and pick up God's way. In fact, one of the greatest ways to learn commitment is in covenant with a spouse because you learn unconditional love. You learn that even though we can disagree, we can still agree to love each other unconditionally. Just because you disagree don't mean that you can't agree to still love each other in spite of the disagreements. You know, the problems with a lot of marriages is they don't know how to love each other in spite of. In spite of them not doing what you wanted them to do. In spite of them not mowing the lawn. In spite of them not looking the way. Can you love somebody in spite of? You don't know you have unconditional love until somebody does something you don't like and you still love them in spite of. We need some in spite of type lovers in the house. <laughs> in spite of how they treat you, you still going to love them. If that, if that man is mean to you, you still cook and love him. If that woman is sassing you or giving you all kind of attitudes, you still call her your beauty queen. <laughs> because there's a king and a fool. There's a queen and a fool in every man and every woman. And whichever one you speak to, that's what you're going to get. You speak to the fool and the man, that's what you're going to get. You speak to the fool and the woman, that's what you're going to get. But if you speak to the king in him, if you speak to the queen in her, you'll get the king or queen. He don't want to come home because every time you come home, you're nagging him. She don't want to join you in your course of life because you're mean. You show everybody else that you love them, but you don't show her that you love her. And now you start sleeping in different rooms. Now you're allowing anger to, 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 to live in your marriage. The Bible says one of the key ingredients that Stacy and I haven't always done accurately, but we try our best, and this is a secret for the married folks, don't let the sun go down on your anger. My gosh. Because you may go to sleep angry, but you'll, you'll wake up bitter. And God don't want you to be bitter. He wants you to be better. You know how you be better? Hey, we, I know we ain't agreeing right now, but can I at least get a kiss before you, go, well, at least before you turn over? It may be a white kiss, but at least it was a kiss. And you know, one of the things Stacy and I always tried to fight for is we go to bed at the same time. Or if, if I'm up late or she's up late, we're gonna, hey, I'll be in the bed soon. I'm, I'm giving y'all some marriage tips right now. <laughs> because it's when we go to bed at the same time and, and we're having conversations and we're talking about our day and we're bonding, it keeps us connected, it keeps us unified. Now, I'm gonna give you this one for free. You don't have to follow this advice. We don't have a TV in the room because the room is for a few things and watching TV ain't one of them. 
I'm trying to keep it PG-13. The room is for sleep and sex and conversation. My mom looked at me like, son. <laughs> That's just, that, it, it don't say that in the Bible. That was just Damien's suggestion. <laughs> just for you. For y'all like, where it say that in the Bible? Now, sometimes, as I mentioned, at the exchange of our talent, our beauty, our charisma, our giftedness, we lose an ingredient called commitment because we get our way so effortlessly because our giftedness, because our talent, because our good looks, because of what we can offer. But God will put you in an environment where people don't care about your looks, where people don't care about your talent. They care about it, but that's not enough to override the fact that you still need character development. We all heard this before. Talent will only take you where character can keep you. And God will expose you to rooms. God will expose you to opportunities that your talent got you so that way you can be motivated to develop your character to eventually not just get exposed in that room but stay in those rooms. So I think about how many of us, including myself at some seasons, we wanted the glory without the suffering. I think about the sons of uh, Zebedee. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Zebedee, thank you, pops. Uh, They had asked to sit at the left and right hand of Jesus. And Jesus says, you you know, they said, can I sit at the left and right of your glory? And Jesus says, you know not the cup or the baptism of what you're asking for. Many of us are expecting something out of 2024, expecting something out of life. And what you're expecting, you don't understand that it comes with a cup. It comes with a posture. It comes with uh, humility. And most importantly, it comes with a prerequisite called commitment. You got to be committed to the process. Yes, God has ordained purpose and promises, but he will not allow talent or charm or beauty to override the process to step into his purpose. And what I had to learn for someone who is good looking, (laughs) for someone who is talented... My wife would agree. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't hear you say amen, babe. Did you agree? Oh, no, I'm just, I, I, I know. <laughs> but someone who had talent, someone who had charm, someone who had giftedness, I realized that I couldn't go around this path called commitment and character. You, it, it, God, his gifts and his callings, as we've been talking about, are irrevocable. But it's up to you if you would develop the commitment or character to get to what he's called you or he's placed on your life. And what I had to learn was that process wasn't to take away greatness. It was to help me become great. We do live in a narcissistic society. We do live in a me, myself, and I kind to kind of world. But we have to understand that selflessness is the key to finding life. I'm going to give you another one for free. Not just selflessness, but delayed gratification. You got to delay some gratification if you're going to step into what God... Let me say it better this way. You got to delay gratification if you're going to step into God's manifestation for your life. I like the rhyme if y'all didn't notice that. (laughs) In a quote, I don't know where it came from, but I, uh, I wrote it down. We should never be afraid to commit an unknown future to a known God. I'll say that again. Man, she got authority in her voice. Say that again, Pastor. All right, I got you. You got me a little nervous. <laughs> Never be afraid to commit an unknown future to a known God. I like what Psalms 37 and 5 says. Commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust him, and he will help you. Man, that is some very small font. <laughs> Commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust him, and he will help you. Commit not some things, everything. That means commit your marriage, commit your kids, commit your finances, commit your heart, commit, your, commit everything to the Lord, and trust him. The prerequisite of saying you trust God means you committed everything to him. You have not really trusted him unless you've committed everything to him. What does it mean to commit everything to the Lord? It means you allow his word, his ways to take the final say-so over what you think is best. 
So it's something that I may want. It's something that I may prefer, and I line it up with the Word of God. If what the Word of God says is different from what I prefer, then I have to let go of what I prefer and take the Word of God. That's what it means to commit, is that I'm willing to let my ideologies, I'm willing to let my philosophy, I'm willing to let my preferences all take the back seat to God's will, word, and ways. Proverbs 16 and 3 says this, Commit your works to the Lord, submit and trust them to him, and your plans will succeed if, somebody say if, if If you respond to his will and guidance. We're on this seven day, we're going to be starting the seven day fast tomorrow, and there's seven focuses, and one of those focuses is guidance. I'm asking that the Lord be a lamp to your feet, a light to your path, and lead you to paths of righteousness in 2024 so you can step into all that God has for you. And some of those paths that God would lead us to righteousness, it's, you're only going to be able to see his path if you walk in humility, which means his path may bring you to a low place, even though you feel like you should be in a high place. His path is always going to require you to, let me say it this way, the grace of God is is good enough to where it won't inflate a person's self-esteem nor deflate a person's self-esteem. It knows how to help you walk in that tension of not overly thinking or having a high thought of myself that's exaggerated, nor does the word of God cause you to think less of yourself. And if that's the case, That means if I'm going to ask God for guidance, that means I'm not too big for small things and I'm not too small for big things. That means I won't run from something that seems like it's beneath me and I won't run from something that terrifies me. That if it feels beneath me, I'll still do it. And if it terrifies me, I still do it. Why? Because it's the God who called me to do it. His grace is sufficient. His power works perfect in our weakness. Now, When we're committed to the right things, check this out, if you're taking notes, it means you're unavailable to the wrong things. When you are committed to the right things, you're unavailable to the wrong things. When I, probably at the age of 24, decided to go on a a vow of abstinence until I got married, guess what? Because I was committing to this lifestyle, I was unavailable from a promiscuous lifestyle. When you commit to the right things, you're unavailable to the wrong things. When I decided not to smoke weed anymore, when I decided to stop drinking, when I decided to stop doing carnal things, I was committed to the right things, so I was no longer available for the wrong things. The thing is, you set a goal in your life and you don't pursue it. And if you have a goal, if you have a vision, something that you know God tells you to do that you don't do it, it's not a value. That's a hobby because you're picking it up some days and you're putting it down some days. But God wants us to be committed to the convictions that he's given us. And some of the breakthrough that you're expecting to have is not going to come from God speaking in an earthquake, speaking in a whirlwind, speaking in breaking rocks. Some of the breakthrough that you're going to get is from God speaking to you in a small, still voice. You're asking for a loud sign when you can't even follow him in quiet convictions. God gives convictions to his sons and daughters. So if you're feeling convicted about a lifestyle, guess what? That's course correction. That's God trying to help you. Everybody wants a savior, but very few people want a king. We want God to save us, but if God is going to save us, then you have to appoint him as king over your life. So what is our first commitment to? It's to God. We got to be committed to God. Then it's to my family. I'm married, so it's my wife, my kids. If you're not married, then it's, it's to your, your family. Then our commitment should be to our church. And sometimes we work for the church, so that can be interchangeably. And then after our commitment is to God, to family, to church, it should be to our work and our purpose and our calling. Now, in different seasons, they may look a little bit different, but we should have commitments and priorities. Somebody say amen to that. Amen. Now, when we lack commitment... What happens is we fall into entitlement. You feel entitled for something that you ain't committed to. You feel entitled to have something that you didn't even put the investment in to have. That's 
because your charm, your talent, your giftedness has always gotten you what you want without you earning it. So now you go through a life very entitled. And now you're entitled, so you're missing out on an ingredient called in commitment because your daddy gave you everything. Your mama gave you everything. You was taught that you was the best thing in the world, which you probably are, but there's always room for growth. There's always room to be pruned. There's always room to be challenged and changed. Man, some of y'all didn't like that. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is, because we get things easy, we don't know how to work for things sometimes. And, and, and the promises of God are for those who are responsible. Man, there is a whole, let me say it better this way. The whole, there's a lot of chapters in the Bible and Proverbs that talk about diligence, that talks about hard work, that uses the ant, that, that is showing us we got to be committed to something. In fact, the Bible says the diligent hand shall bear rule. Some of the breakthroughs we're not experiencing because we start something, then we what? Stop something. Then we start something, then we what? Stop something. Then we start, then we stop. But God is saying, how about don't stop, and it don't got to look perfect, just stay in the process. It don't got to look perfect. I, I, my, my mother is right here on the front row. She'll tell you my son has always been a perfectionist. <laughs> I like excellence. I like things to be and look a certain way. I like my car, my house, my closets. But I've learned that some of my pursuit for perfection was really an insecurity to try to present myself a certain way in front of people. And then if they don't see me a certain way, I get insecure because I want to present an image that I'm perfect, that I don't have mistakes, that I'm flawed. And God is saying, I don't want you to present an image that you're perfect. I want you to present an image that you're in Christ. And if you're in Christ, everyone has a process they have to go through, which means I don't strive for perfection. I strive for progress. And it's in the progress I get perfected. Amen. Come on. So, my question to us is why commitment hasn't worked for some of us? The Bible says, it's not going to be on, your, uh, on the screen, where there is no vision, no revelation of God's word, the people are unrestrained. Another version said when there's no redemptive revelation of who God is, we live life without self-control. So I mentioned earlier I was somewhat of an extreme person when I was in the world, and when I committed to something, I committed to it. And I used to wonder why my commitment toward these things didn't yield the results and then I realized that you can have a commitment spirit, but one of the reasons why commitment doesn't work, because we could be committed to the wrong things. I was committed to the wrong priorities. Some, some people put the priority of being a workaholic, where you have no work-life balance. So it's all about work, work, work. You don't have a balance for your family. You don't have a balance for yourself. So the priority of being a workaholic won't yield the result that if you're committed to the right things, you'll see yourself step into the godly things. We can be committed, we have the wrong motivation sometimes. We're seeking approval, trying to impress others. We can be committed to the wrong cause. You can be committed to this party or that party, but not committed to the kingdom of God. You heard me say it, I'm, I, my, my allegiance is not to a donkey, it's not, a, it's not to an elephant, it's to the Lamb of God. Why is this important? Because those human institutions are flawed. And if you commit yourself to a flawed system, but yet want perfect results, you're going to be frustrated in life. <laughs> Man, I don't know why that word, it's just hard for me to say, I don't know. Man, I, I can't be perfect. No, I'm just like... But, but if, if I'm committed to the kingdom of God, which takes imperfect people to do a perfect work inside of you and I, then God can use the, perfect, uh, the imperfect to still do a perfect work. 
But when I'm committed to flawed systems, when I'm committed to man-made things and not kingdom agenda godly things, what happens is I get discouraged. I get disappointed. And again, I believe as we're coming to this political season, we should vote and we should do it responsibly. I'm even considering doing a sermon series called Christ culture and politics to help Christians know how to navigate through a very divisive time. But at the end of the day, we are kingdom citizens above a certain party. I belong into the kingdom before I belong in this agenda. And when you put this agenda above the kingdom, guess what? You made an idol out of it. I'll touch on this a little bit more if we do that season or that series. So, so we also can be committed to the wrong way of serving. You think busyness means you're committed. Ooh, let me say this to that busy person. You're busy because you want to distract yourself from actually working on the most important work yourself. Amen. Hear me out, moms. It's easy to work on your kids because you ain't got to work on yourself. Amen. Hear me out, fathers and husbands. It's easy to work on your wife or it's easy to work on your employees because you ain't got to work on yourself. We can be so busy doing things to rob us of the commitment, the most important commitment, which is working on ourselves. That's one of the most important commitments is to work on you. Because guess what? You are a full-time job. Yes, you are. I said it. Full-time job. Matter of fact, we need overtime to deal with you. Sheesh. Oh, man, don't get in trouble, bro. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm messing with you. So we can also be committed to the wrong people. You don't want to get married because you've committed yourself to people who weren't worthy of your heart, worthy of your virtue, worthy of your time. So now, because you invested into the wrong man, invested into the wrong woman, invested into the wrong people, invested into the wrong voice, now you make, you make statements like this, I ain't ever going to get married. There's no good man. There's no good woman. You are really going to say an absolute statement that in all these billions of people in this world, no one is good? That's because you committed to the wrong things. You, let me say it this way. God, the integrity of God will show you the signs of somebody that's unhealthy. You, did, you ignored those signs, and you still wanted to go after that. So the situation that you're in is not because it's a God issue. You ignored the signs, the convictions that God was trying to tell you, leave, run, get away from this situation. And now you want to make it seem like God is not good and people aren't good. Now you got trust issues, and now you're passing those trust issues down to your kids. And now your kids think men are no good. And now your kids think women are no good. And now, now, now they're confused sexually. Now they don't know if they want to be a man or a woman because they didn't have a healthy home where a husband and a wife who love Jesus can model what it looks like to be in a godly home. Let me say it this way. Our objective should not be to get God to bless our vision, dreams, and plans in life, but our objective should be to align our life with his vision, his dreams, and plans. He is already blessed over our life. I'm going to say that again. Our objective should not be to get God to bless our vision, our dreams, our plans, but to align our life into the vision, dreams, and plans. He is already blessed. God already blessed me to be a pastor before I became a pastor. As you guys know, I was trying to be a club promoter and a real estate agent. Those plans weren't blessed. I might have had some fun with those plans, but they weren't blessed. They didn't have the fulfillment that I'm living out now. And we not just need commitment. Let me say it better. We don't just need commitment to God, family, work, church, our purpose. We need commitment to our subcommitments. And what do I mean by that? You need to be committed to your values that you set. You need to be committed to your boundaries. Let me, let me help you out. Boundaries are not boundaries unless you reinforce them. If you set a boundary and you don't reinforce them, that wasn't a boundary. That was just a wish. Can you not do that, please? Okay. <laughs> boundaries are reinforced. If you call me at 10 o'clock, I'm not going to answer. They call you at 10.01. Don't answer. <laughs> 
So we have to be committed to our sub-commitments, our values, our boundaries. And the most important commitment that we should have to ourselves is renewing our mind daily. Tell your neighbor, say, renew your mind daily. Say, we, we both need it. Go ahead. Just. So true commitment means sacrifice. Now, I understand that when we're, the Bible says this, unless a grain of wheat fall to the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. Now, I realize that, let me use myself as an example, when I was in seasons of committing to the process, I couldn't tell the difference if I felt planted or buried. Because they have similarities. They both are, if you're planted, if a seed is planted, there's darkness. If something is buried, it's darkness. If something is planted, it's obscurity. If something is buried, it's obscurity. Like, they both feel the same. In being planted, you feel overwhelmed just like being buried. You're trapped. You're suppressed. You lost control because you have no hope. It involves confinement. If you're planted or buried, you're in a confined space. If you're planted or buried, you're, you're, you're going to have periods of darkness. It involves a phase of darkness. But we have to understand when you are planted versus being buried, if you feel buried because you're honoring God, if you feel buried because you're following the things of God, you're not buried, you're being planted. But if you feel buried because you're doing what you want, you're gratifying your flesh, you're doing everything you want to do apart from God, then you might be being buried. You might, you, you might have something that is going to happen around the corner. I'm not speaking doom and gloom, but the wages of sin is what? Death. Now, that doesn't always mean a physical death. The wages of drinking coffee all day, every day. If you drink 10 cups of coffee, you don't drink any water, more than likely the wage of that is you might have something hit your body that might show up in a form of something that could lead to death. But the thing about God is, although the wages of sin is death, the gift of God is eternal life. It's to righteousness. So God can always reverse what the enemy tried to put in motion. You might have started off in a, in a wage that is not going to yield results. But here, th this is what I love about God that I know Satan hates. I can simply repent. Oh, my gosh. There should have been more clappers on this one. You mean to tell me I can cuss somebody out? I can do something sinful, whether it's intentional or not. I can act a fool and still come to God as long as I'm sincere and say, God, I was showing myself off in a negative way. Please forgive me. And he will accept you as if you've never sinned, ever. That's something worth being excited about. Now, that's not a license to sin, but it's an empowerment to say when you do sin, don't run from God. When you do mess up, because you will mess up. You will make mistakes. You will cross lines that you, you vowed you'll never cross. And you can come boldly before the throne room of God and ask for forgiveness. And Jesus will never turn down forgiveness. He will never turn. I don't care if you murdered. I don't care if you lied. I don't care if you were a doter. Jesus will never turn down forgiveness. He died and he paid for every and any and all sin once and for all when he was on the cross. And when he said it was finished, that means your redemption, your healing, your breakthrough, your forgiveness. It was all forgiven in Christ. And I'll say it this way. I believe it would be easier for you to commit to God when you realize how much he's committed to you. He said he is faithful and fair to finish the work in which he begun in you. God is so committed to you. He's so committed to your happiness. He's so committed to your peace. He's so committed to your joy. God is committed. He's so committed. This is why he gave you the Holy Spirit, the same spirit that lived in Jesus. When Jesus died, he said it's profitable or it's important that I go be with God so that I can send you the comforter, the standby, the advocate, the intercessor so that you can step into everything that Jesus purchased for you and I to step into. Being planted is a part of God's plan to bless us. 
And I'm going to say this, and you may not agree with it, but it don't matter because I can back it up with the Bible. <laughs> it's impossible to be planted. Let me say it better this way. If you say you're planted, but you're not connected to a church, you're not planted. If you say you're planted and you're not serving, giving your time, talent, or treasure in a church, you're not planted. That's not planted. That's a fan, not a follower. But God redeemed his church. He loves his bride so much that he sent the groom, Jesus Christ, to die for her. So that now the bride, the church, can be the hands, the body of Christ to help nurture, mature us, and to develop us. I hear Christians, you can be saved and not have a church home, but you can't be planted and not have a church home. Yeah, you'll make it to heaven because you accepted Jesus. That's a free gift. But if you want to bring heaven on earth, you're going to need a pastor. You're going to need a community. You're going to need a church where you can serve with your ta talent, time, and treasure. So many people are like, I'm the church. We are the church. I'm, I'm the church. The church is wherever I go. No one person can claim monopoly on the church. The ecclesia, the called out ones to gather and assemble in the body. So to be the church means you're connected to a local body. It means you're connected to a local body that has pastors, teachers, evangelists, prophets, apostles for the fivefold working ministry to equip the saints. But if you're not in that and you're calling yourself the church, I think you've been, you've been misguided. You've been misguided because I am a part of the church when I'm connected to the church. If I don't have a church home, I don't have a pastor, I don't have a leader, I don't have a place where I can submit my gifts, I can grow in the kingdom. I, I, I can't just say I'm the church because the church implies that you're connected and you're a part of a body. But if you're not part of a body, you're living in isolation. Yes, you are saved. Yes, you're a child of God. Yes, God loves you. But you're missing out on a key component to stepping into your purpose and destiny, which is being committed to the church. See, so you was committed to your unsaved friends when they lied and they did certain things to, to you. But as soon as somebody don't do something you like in church, I forget that church. I'm not going to be a part of that church. And we call it church hurt. You mean people hurt? We, 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 as long as we live in this world, people going to hurt us. But I know when I was in the world and I would be on my way to the club and I didn't like something my friend did and, 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 and he had the car, I would still ride with him because he had the car. He, he had a car that I'm trying to get to this destination and have some fun. Well, church is the vehicle to get to the presence of God oftentimes. Church is the vehicle to help you grow in God. So whether you like the person or not, you still need the vehicle to get to your destination. So, Nick, can I get some pads? I want to talk about real quick, and I'm coming to a close. Why don't some Christians walk in the fullness of God? It's a good question. Why doesn't some Christians walk in the... Why is it some Christians can look blessed and some look like they keep struggling? They don't walk in the fullness of God. This is a question that I've often asked myself. And this is something that I was like, Lord, I, I want all of what you have for me. And number one, you have no vision. You have no plan or strategy for your life. The greatest strategy for life, guess what, is the word of God. In the Old Testament, military campaigns were built on a prophetic word. Kings would be able to subdue kingdoms because they had a prophetic word from God. They had a vision. They had a plan. And they had a strategy from God. And I'm not just talking about your vision. I'm talking about God's vision for your life. God's plan for your life. God's strategy. You don't have a vision. You don't have a plan. You don't have a strategy. You're just winging it in life. I'm a creative Oh, let me leave it there. <laughs> Number two, once God reveals the vision, plan, or strategy, you're not committed to the vision. You're not committed to the plan. And you're not committed to the strategy. And the last one, you move too slow. God's giving you a vision. He's giving, he said, write that book. You didn't write it. Write that song. You didn't write it. Start that business. You didn't start it. Again, the gifts and the callings of God are irrevocable. But his plan, 
his strategy to get you to where he's called you can change. They have prophetic windows. In other words, you have to apply and obey God when he tells you to move. When he moves, you need to be like Ludacris. When you move, I'll move just like that. Oh, y'all know Ludacris? And there's some things in my life that I had to grieve that God had for me to do at 20, which would have got me to where I'm at sooner. But I didn't obey him. So he had to reroute another plan, another strategy, another vision. Do you know the whole purpose of why we have a devotion with God, the whole purpose why we come to church, the whole purpose why we read our Bibles is so that we can get instructions, not just to check something off. Not like the rich ruler who came to Jesus and said, what must I do to be this? I, I, I give or I do this. He lists off a bunch of things that he did, and Jesus gave him a set of instructions. Sell all your possessions, give it to the poor, and follow me. And he walked away sad. And the Bible says he had great possessions. I want to challenge that. He didn't have great possessions. Possessions had him greatly. So I want to close on this passage of Scripture. I feel like this is a prophetic word for us. 2 Kings 13, verse 15 through 19. Elisha, the one who uh, received the mantle from Elijah, is at the end of his life. He's at the end of his ministry. In fact, Elisha, because he was so committed to his mentor, he was so committed to his church, he was so committed to the vision and plan of God for his life. He was able to get a double portion. He was able to get a double portion of the spirit of his mentor. And you see recorded that Elisha did more miracles. He did more things. He did greater things than the one before him. This is a shadow. Jesus says, greater works shall you do. In other words, Jesus went before us. And he died, and he, and he rose again, but he did miracles while he was uh, on earth. He did so many things, and he said, greater works will you do when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And we see that God is saying there's greater in store for you. So Elijah is ministering to Joash, king of Israel, because this king is Lamenting about his situation, expressing his concerns about the threats that are coming to Israel. How many times have you expressed to God the threats that are in your marriage, the threats that are in your finances? You're expressing, God, I, I need you to move. God, if you don't do something today, I might lose it all together. I need you to intervene. This is what the king is doing. He's saying, I need a word from God. And he gets a word. And Elijah said to him, take a, take a bow and some arrows. So he took himself a bow and some arrows. Then he said to the king of Israel, put your hand on the bow. So he put his hand on it. And Elijah put his hand on the king's hand. You know what this represents? Divine intervention. The prophet is putting his hand on the king's hand, symbolizing God's hands. That God is like, I'm going to intervene on your behalf. And he said, open the east window. And he opened it. Notice instructions is taking place. He's following every bit of the instructions. Then Elijah said, shoot, and he shot. You know what I heard somebody say? You're going to miss 100 shots. How's it go? You're going to miss all the shots you didn't take. Something like that. You got me. I wasn't in the spirit on that one. <laughs> you, got, you got that. <laughs> then Elijah said, shoot, and he shot. And he said, the arrow of the Lord's deliverance and the arrow of deliverance from Syria. In other words, this is symbolic that you're shooting the shot in the direction of where you need deliverance. And not only is the Lord going to deliver you, God is going to deliver you from your enemies. Let's keep reading. Then he said, the arrow of the Lord's deliverance and the arrow of deliverance from Syria. For you must strike the Syrians at Aphek till you have destroyed them. Somebody say strike. Till you have destroyed them. Then he said, take the arrow. So he took them. And he said to the king of Israel, strike the ground. Somebody say, strike the ground. Strike We're in the clothes. So he struck three times and stopped. Look what the man of God says after this. And the man of God was angry with him. And he said, you should have struck five or six times. Six times. 
Then you would have struck Syria till you had destroyed it. But now you will strike Syria only three times. What does this represent? That God had used the prophet to get this king a battle plan. And the plan was to keep striking and to keep striking. He was never to stop striking, but he only struck three times. And because he struck three times and he wasn't committed, he wasn't fully committed to the plan, the purpose, the strategies of God. The prophet got angry and said, because you did this partially, you're going to only have a partial victory. Because you're halfway committed to me, you'll have halfway breakthroughs. Because you're halfway invested into me, you'll only see me halfway. But this man of God told the king, if you would have struck it five or six times until your enemy was defeated, you would have saw total victory. And the lesson that I'm trying to share today is until we give God everything, Till we give God all our heart, all our mind, all our soul, and all that is within us, we won't see the victory. The victories of God are not on a half version of ourselves. It's on the full version of ourselves. God gave all of Jesus so we can receive all of him. I wonder what would happen if you struck again. But pastor, I forgave, forgive again. But pastor, I gave, give again. But pastor, I trust it, trust again. But pastor, I, I tried, try again. Keep striking, keep committing, keep pursuing, keep fighting. Don't give up. The plans of God will secure your victory if you stay committed to God.